This is CBC Vancouver News. I don't live in the Pierre Polyev campaign office and baloney factory. A showdown between BC's Premier and the man vying to become Canada's next Prime Minister with the carbon tax in the crosshairs. Plus... So when we got here, it was just peak winter, so it got pretty cold at night. It's uh, happening to people who might not feel very comfortable approaching shelters. Hidden homelessness, a growing problem in Metro Vancouver and virtually no way to track it. Also... And we'll often see folks sitting on the sidewalk outside of buildings that have free Wi-Fi because that's the only way they can access it. But that's about to change. Why the city's move to expand free Wi-Fi to the downtown east side is considered such a game changer for so many. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Tanya Fletcher. A man has died in some kind of boating accident in Langley. RCMP say they received a call about a boat operator in distress on the Fraser River area around 5 p.m. yesterday. Officers say it appeared the boat had collided with a metal tide pole. They believe the 65-year-old man was alone on the boat. First responders tried to save him, but he wound up dying from his injuries. In Abbotsford, charges have been laid following a homicide involving a husband and wife this weekend. A 41-year-old woman was found with serious stab wounds inside this home Friday night. She later died in the hospital. The 50-year-old man who was arrested at the scene has today been charged with second-degree murder. The two were married, and investigators say this was an isolated case. To mark Anti-Racism Day, rallies have been held right across the country, calling on the federal government to create a program to regularize the status of migrants. One of those protests happened in Vancouver today as part of what's being called the Migrant Spring. Right now our system is uh, built on exclusion and exploitation. Uh, people here, their immigration status is dependent, dependent on employers, dependent on their uh, family members, dependent on schools, and uh, that makes it difficult for migrants to stand up for their rights. So when we get permanent residence status for all, we're allowing people to organize and demand their rights together. The immigration minister said in December he was preparing a program that would allow many undocumented people to apply for permanent residency, but protesters say they don't want anyone left out. Well, this weekend's warm weather meant another sunny day spent basking at the beach for many. I'm loving it right now. It's nice when I'm in the sun, it's warm, and then when you get in the shade, it's a little cooler, so... It's a perfect contrast. I just came down uh, from Deep Cove hike and then uh, I'm about to bike with my friends. It was really sunny today and I kind of got hot. Yeah, me too. Weather records in 39 communities across BC were shattered yesterday as temperatures spiked province-wide. Abbotsford, Agassi, Hope and Merritt are among the places reaching the low 20s. Today, Pitt Meadows was the hot spot in Canada at 21 degrees Celsius as of 2 o'clock this afternoon. Environment Canada says the ridge of high pressure responsible is expected to weaken starting late Tuesday. LBC's premier is sending a clear no signal to the federal conservative leader. Pierre Polyev is calling on the province to stop administering its own carbon tax program. It's part of his campaign to halt Ottawa's carbon tax, which is set to increase next month. Janelle Hamilton has reaction. In most provinces, Ottawa imposes the carbon tax. BC is one of a handful that has its own carbon tax program. We've actually pretty habitually beat the, the federal baseline, the backstop that's in place. Uh, but of course, a lot of people are getting really concerned about the rate increases that we're expecting to see. On Friday, Premier David Eby received a letter from federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev asking him to stop administering the tax program provincially. I don't live in the Pierre Polyev campaign office and baloney factory. Uh, I live in British Columbia. I'm the Premier. Decisions have consequences. I understand the Premier's hesitancy to pull back from what he sees as a pretty significant part of his government's approach to, to climate action here in BC. But I think that there's also a strong case to be made for why people are opposed to it right now. EB says letting the federal government take over the program wouldn't be in the best interest of British Columbians. If we followed Mr. Polyev's suggestion that there would be less money returned to British Columbians. 
The tax is set to increase by about 23 percent on April 1st. Seven premiers have called on Ottawa to freeze the tax hike until inflation cools. But the federal government is pushing back. Climate change is an existential threat to the future of the human race. It's not going away. And the longer we take to actually take action, uh, the more dire the situation becomes for our children and our grandchildren. Opposition BC United leader Kevin Falcon insists now is not the time to increase taxes. In a post online, he can be seen shaking Polyev's hand with the caption, Spike the Hike. This expert says by administering the rebates at a provincial level, it gives provinces more control on where the money goes. If they make the decision to collect it, increase it at the minimum threshold, they can then say, well, all of this, we'll just give it back directly to those who paid for it, or we'll give it back to consumers who need it the most, to taxpayers, we'll, give it, we'll invest it in green technology. Right now, the carbon pricing plan is set at $65 a tonne. As of April 1st, it will be $80 a tonne and will continue to rise until 2030. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, housing advocates say they are seeing an alarming rise in what's called hidden homelessness in the Lower Mainland. Whether it's people sleeping in abandoned buildings, their cars, or on a friend's couch, keeping account of the problem has become a real challenge. Saurabh Sandhu has that story. We had two uh, camping mats that we would place down. These seats fold in so that it gets kind of flat, and we would just both lay uh, foot to head. For more than five months, Tommy Suva Petrie and his brother lived in their van. Back in New Brunswick, housing isn't as quite as expensive or it's not quite as hard to find. So when we first got to Vancouver, it was a little overwhelming and it was a bit of a shock as well. For two people to sleep in van, Petrie says, was a challenge in itself. When we got here, it was just peak winter, so we got pretty cold at night. Um, other than having a couple blankets, there really wasn't too much we could do. But after months of struggle, Petrie was able to find a job at Union Gospel Mission, who helped him move into their transitional housing. And after a year, Petrie and his brother moved into the mission's permanent housing unit. But not everyone with temporary accommodation, also known as hidden homelessness, is so lucky. It's uh, happening to people who might not feel very comfortable approaching shelters or maybe they don't know where to find the right resources for them. So this would disproportionately affect women. It would affect people from the 2SLGBTQIA community. It would affect uh, youth and seniors. Housing advocates say people like Petrie often face additional challenges to find housing as their transitional accommodation spaces make them even more vulnerable. People that are couch surfing, people that are living in their vehicle and we can go around looking at the state of vehicles, the state of motorhomes, the state of the boats in the harbour and it is a transitional space. In a recent survey conducted by Homelessness Service Association of BC, more than 4,800 people were identified as experiencing homelessness in 2023. That was an increase of 32 percent compared to 2020 and this data may not cover those living in transitional spaces. So when you're finding homeless folks out there, you're you're likely undercounting because of all the different parks, locations. Well, says people dealing with the problem often find themselves homeless in the same community where they last had housing. And that cost of housing and low income remain two dominant factors why this problem continues to build. Saurabh Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, Vancouver City Council is moving ahead with plans to bring free Wi-Fi to the downtown east side. As Michelle Morton reports, advocates say internet access is crucial for many trying to escape the grips of poverty. I'm going to be able to go through Wi-Fi and try to talk to my family, my friends, my doctor, make appointments. I'd be able to do everything I normally would without buying airtime from my phone. The city's free Wi-Fi network is currently offered through a mix of private and public buildings, including libraries and community centres. This week, City Councillor Christine Boyle put forward a motion to expand Wi-Fi access throughout the downtown east side, and it passed unanimously. Access to Wi-Fi allows people access to so many important resources and services uh, that are a lifeline for people's health, for uh, addressing social isolation and more. That access is so critical in making sure people are able to uh, participate in, in their community. 
The move is being praised by neighborhood residents and those providing social services. As it unlocks so many things, whether that's trying to find shelter for the night, whether that's trying to find uh, your doctor, whether that's trying to find employment. And so Wi-Fi is really essential for all those different things to open up different avenues. And it would be great to see more access in the downtown east side because we have heard there are some spots that might not have uh, full access. And we'll often see folks sitting on the sidewalk outside of buildings that have free Wi-Fi because that's the only way they can access it. And so this is a really important step to be able to uh, implement some Wi-Fi across the, the community to be able to have uh, broader access and really help people uh, access the services that they need. City staff are being asked to report back to council by the end of this year with a timeline and a budget for the free Wi-Fi expansion. Michelle Morton, CBC News, Vancouver. A photographer has captured a spectacular sight off the west coast of Vancouver Island, and the images are getting attention from around the world. When Euclid's Jeff Johnson heard that a herring spawn was converging this weekend, he grabbed his camera and his drone and headed straight for Terrace Beach. That happens once a year in my backyard. Of course I'm going to go check it out. The blue bubble gum, like, the, you know, pink bubble gum was pink, blue or purple, that blue color. He captured this video of the ocean turning a stunning turquoise blue. It's a common sight in March when female fish release eggs into the water. They're then fertilized by males. It's also a fleeting sight, however, as the spawn usually only stick around for a day or two. Well, the roe, the herring carry, is a traditional food for First Nations peoples. And it's being harvested in a unique way now by Indigenous fishers to share with family near and far. They spawn onto the trees and then we can then harvest those trees and then harvest the row off of those for eating raw or for cooking. These hemlock bows are weighed down in the water where the small silver fish are spawning. That's to encourage the herring to lay their eggs there. Once harvested, the delicacy is then delivered from a house to more distant community members in Port Alberni, Nanaimo and Victoria to enjoy as well. Well, this Sunday was a wash in green for St. Patrick's Day celebrations. In Vancouver, partiers descended on Gastown to usher in the return of the St. Patrick's Day street party. It's the first time the festivities have been seen on those unmistakable cobblestone streets since the pandemic. Check it out. Street party since the pandemic. So the last one was 2018. Uh, stopped with the pandemic, of course. Timing's right. It's a great weekend for it. Um, and everyone's really excited that the street party has returned. The drinking gods have shined upon us today, you know. Old St. Patrick himself is looking down with a wink and a gleam in his eye. Everyone's out, everyone's having a great time. We're having a phenomenal day. Well, still ahead, another volcanic eruption in Iceland. Flowing lava is starting to slow down and barriers are holding, protecting a small fishing town. We'll have the full details coming up next.
Welcome back. Taking you overseas, UNICEF today said 13,000 children have been killed in Israel's Gaza offensive. The agency's head says the child death rate is almost unprecedented in recent world conflicts, and she added her voice to warnings of an impending starvation disaster. In, in, in Israel, meanwhile, the same message came from visiting German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. We cannot stand by and watch Palestinians risk starvation. That's not us. That is not what we stand for together. Schultz says Israel must get more provisions into Gaza. Earlier, he urged against Israel's planned offensive on Rafah. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, though, again promised it would be preceded by the zone's evacuation. But in cabinet today, he also repeated Friday's vow that the offensive will, in fact, go ahead. One of the most repeated images of the Gaza conflict is footage of rescue workers desperately trying to save the wounded. The CBC's Margaret Evans takes a look behind the scenes of the emergency efforts and at a mission in January that made headlines. An emergency call center at the Palestine Red Crescent Society in Ramallah. Set up with the help of Canadian money a decade ago and mainly serving the occupied West Bank. Since October 7th, it's been taking war calls from Gaza. The teams there struggling to operate under an Israeli military campaign that has claimed more than 30,000 lives, most women and children. I think only that I want this war to finish, says Nihal Kurdi, a nurse, because the pain is so hard. Dispatcher Rana Fake believes Israel targets Red Crescent workers in Gaza. We lost 14 of our staff while they were providing humanitarian care, she says, and 13 workers and volunteers are apparently being detained. Details of the agency's movements are normally communicated to the Israeli military through international partners. Last month, the Red Crescent suspended missions in Gaza for 48 hours as a protest, saying they couldn't guarantee safety for staff or patients. In January, two medics were dispatched to rescue a lone child surrounded by dead relatives after their car was apparently hit by Israeli fire as they fled Gaza City. <laughs> Faki is one of the three dispatchers who spoke with six-year-old Hind Rajab for three hours as she and they waited for Israeli confirmation of a secure route for an ambulance. <laughs> Faki says she felt like she'd lost a daughter. The call center lost contact with Hind and the medics sent to find her. The burnt-out remains of their ambulance and the bodies of Hind and her family found days later. The Israeli military tells us that their tanks were apparently not in the area at the time, although they say that's been referred for further investigation. In terms of specific allegations on targeting, they say Hamas regularly shields itself behind medical facilities and infrastructure in Gaza. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Jerusalem. In Russia, Vladimir Putin has won a new term as president in a landslide. It's a result no one ever seriously doubted, a result that Western countries are now ridiculing, and a result that Putin's opponents were resigned to. The CBC's Briar Stewart has more. As the millions of ballots cast across Russia were counted, it was clear there would be no surprises. Putin, Putin. Vladimir Putin appeared to win by a landslide. Three others might have been on the ballot, but from the beginning it was understood this election was about giving Putin a fifth term as president. There were some small signs of dissent in Russia. Before opposition leader Alexei Navalny died in an Arctic prison last month, 
He urged people to turn out at polling stations en masse at noon. His widow, Yulia Navalnaya, did. After hours waiting to vote in Berlin, she wrote her husband's name on top of her ballot. In his victory speech, Putin acknowledged for the first time that he agreed to release Navalny in a prisoner exchange shortly before his death. But things happen, he said. There's nothing you can do about it. Beside a memorial for Navalny in London, people protested. Well, across the street, some of the two million Russians living abroad lined up to cast their ballots. This was the scene outside of the Russian embassy in London. People came from all across the UK. Many waited for hours just to vote in an election that they don't believe in. I think I'll vote against everybody because I don't have an option that I can vote for, that I would like to vote for. So. Security was stepped up in many places ahead of the vote. In Moldova, the authorities say someone threw a petrol bomb at the Russian embassy. In Perm, Russia, there are reports that somebody set off a firework at a polling station. Russia's government said it launched more than 60 criminal cases during the vote, and some are anxious about what could come next. Uh, military authorities of Russia, they will uh, try to provide new uh, offense on Ukraine during this summer, and to do this, they for sure, they need new military mobilization. Putin is billing his victory as proof that the Russian public trusts him and the direction he's taking the country in. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Well, flowing lava started slowing today following last night's volcanic eruption in Iceland. This was the volcano's fourth eruption since December. Scientists say the volume of lava and other volcanic material was higher than the last one. But man-made barriers do appear to be holding. They're protecting infrastructure and a small fishing town. Two of the previous eruptions forced the town to evacuate. Authorities had been warning for several weeks now that a new eruption was expected. Here's a live shot of the Georgia Viaduct in BC Place. Well, it was a glorious March weekend, but how long will it last? I'll time out this powerful high pressure system that's on the way next.
I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Benit Brach at the Alumni UBC webinar, Build the Future with Gen Z, April 3rd. A panel of Gen Z UBC students and alumni will share their views and experiences about their cohort's values and aspirations, approaches to work, and more. And never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox. And time for the five-day forecast, another summer-like day right across uh, the whole province, really. And you can see that will persist tonight as well with those clear conditions, a few clouds here and there, but otherwise uh, on the plus side for those overnight values. Here's why that ridge of high pressure isn't budging, and it's uh, in place right across BC through Monday, most of Tuesday. Uh, late Tuesday is when we'll start to see things that uh, maybe cloud over a bit in most areas. And then midweek by Wednesday, we'll probably see some rain return, at least in pockets through many places of BC, the south and the interior, the north coast as well. So enjoy that uh, precipitation uh, free weather while we have it. Here's our five day forecast for Metro Vancouver. You can see we've got uh, mainly sunny conditions for Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday we'll see that rain return. But as we said, the unusual thing about this system is not just how warm it's been, five to 10 degrees above seasonal values. Uh, and it's just for most of BC. So it's really stretching right across the entire province. We've been seeing that all weekend and enjoy that one last day before we get back to our more normal March-like conditions. And that is your late news for this Sunday, March 17th. For news anytime, anywhere, download the free CBC News app. You can always find us online as well. We're at cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local newscast is on the early edition. That's on CBC Radio 1 starting tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Thanks so much for watching this weekend and happy St. Patrick's Day.